Okay, everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over UFC 282. Um, and I'm going to be doing this video strictly from a DFS perspective. And then in a subsequent video, I will be analyzing it from a betting perspective. And as you've seen the last several weeks, when I've kind of made these separate videos, how different the analysis can be. And you're, you're able to make really good DFS lineups with guys that you would never go near uh, betting wise, and you'd be betting guys that you really wouldn't be playing in DFS, uh, and you could bet them on the same card. Um, you have to be able to make peace with that idea um, uh, when you're when, when you're betting and, and doing DFS at the same time. As we'll discuss when we do the betting video, just the breakdown and the analysis is just completely different. Comes from a completely different angle, and let's talk about that for just a second with respect to DFS because I think it's somewhat relevant specific to this card. Remember the, the, the entire concept, not the entire concept, but one major assumption that you have to make, you don't have to make that, it's probably a good idea to make when you're doing DFS projections, DFS analysis or whatever, is that the lines uh, implied by Las Vegas and the betting markets are somewhat efficient. And, and then what you do is based on those money lines, based on those prop lines and things like that, you can develop um, you can develop either projections or takes uh, from a DFS perspective, but the overarching presumption or assumption or presumption is that the Vegas lines are somewhat accurate. Um, and we can debate that uh, with respect to uh, MMA a little bit, only because MMA is not as liquid of a market as, um, as say the NFL or, or, or the NBA. So when you have an, a, you know, a market, which is, it's, it's just got all kinds of limits involved in some of these props. Um, it doesn't really give you a, a great, the a perfect idea of, of what an efficient market looks like. Uh, it, it's somewhat efficient, but not completely efficient. So in let, but however, unless you have really, really good leans and really good takes, uh, with respect to the lines being wrong, you're probably better off in general, just going with the Vegas lines as being the, the baseline, you know what I mean? To, to, to start your analysis. And, and again, how do you get your edge in DFS is not, is not by trying to beat the line. It's by trying to beat the other uh, players, right? Trying to beat the other DFS contestants. And remember it's a contest. You're competing against other people where when you're betting something, you're betting against the bookmaker and the fixed line. So you're taking the same assumptions when you're dealing with DFS and you're hoping to create lineups that have leverage, that are lower owned, that, you know, and, 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 and things that we talk about in DFS all the time. Um, however, there, there's one thing that I've been kind of working with and working on as far as my analysis of, of, of MMA DFS and actually applies to all DFS, but specifically to MMA, I guess, um, is that whenever you have matchups that have a lot of unknowns, uh, whether that be lack of tape on a fighter, lack of data on a fighter, just lack of knowledge of a fighter overall, you could argue that that particular line is less efficient than the lines uh, in fights with kind of regulars that people that fight against each other all the time, that fight the same promotion all the time, because th those fighters, you know, you could compare apples to apples. You can get a real good sense for who's good and who's not. There's a lot of data on these guys and, and the people that are big betters will take all that into consideration. So it's, 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 I think it's decent to say that the regulars, probably the lines are more likely to be efficient than the than the fights or the games or whatever, but the fights involving guys coming from different promotions, guys that are making their debuts, guys that are you know just guys you've never heard of or guys that nobody's heard of. Um, now, do you know which way the line might be inefficient? Well, if you're a total expert on these guys, maybe. But if not, what you can say is that those lines have more room to be wrong. In other words, that those lines have more room to have extreme uh, extreme variance. Okay, um, and when it comes to DFS, 
that becomes a really big deal. Hold on a second. Sorry, I, I must have lost my train of thought. But I, the idea then is for DFS, these fights where we're going to presume the lines might be fishy are really good for us because you want variance. You want um, you want there to be uncertainty because in GPPs, you don't care about finishing last or not. I mean, you either want to finish. If you could guarantee me finishing nothing but first or last, you'd be a billionaire. Right. Because that's the way results distribute and the way that, you know, the payouts. Go up. You, know, you guys all know this, but for those of you kind of watching the first time, I, uh, I apologize. Uh, I apologize for those of you who've been watching this a lot. You're, I'm telling you things that you knew, you knew already. In any case, this particular card, you have several spots like that where you have these big favorites with these pretty big inside the distance props and all this stuff. And you, you, you just don't know. <laughs> whether these are efficient or not. So I, it becomes a really, really cool exercise in, in trying to figure out whether to attack those fights. And as usual, in DFS, a lot of it comes down to ownership, you know? Um, and the ownership projections are all over the place this week, and which makes it even harder. Um, but we're gonna attempt to make heads or tails of this. and and. Let's start like right from the beginning. So first fight of the night, you have guy number one, no one's ever heard of versus guy number two, you never ever heard of. You have Cameron Simon versus Steven Kozlo. You have Cameron Simon, who's like four years old. Okay. Uh, he's really, really young. He's coming off a lower level promotion and he's a minus 400. Okay. Against Steven Kozlo, who's also undefeated. Both these guys are undefeated. And Steven Kozlo has been fighting in, in even a lower, lower level of promotion. He's been fighting just basically in the streets. I mean, maybe not, but, and he's six and home. Um, and Steven Kozlo is taking this on one week's notice. So should Cameron Samen be four to one? I have no idea, you know, but does that mean that he should be pick him? You know what I mean? Even, even though you could say that this line is probably, probably wrong. You know, you, nobody really knows these two guys and nobody certainly knows how these two guys would go at each other. It's very possible this could be closer to a pickup. It's very possible this could be closer to like a minus 700. It's just, it's just this, this line carries with it just so much variance. Um, let, let's take a look at the inside the distance prop here. You have uh, Samen versus Kozlo. You have... Uh, same in winning inside the distance is minus 120, okay, which is which is really good. Um, that's a strong inside the distance prop for someone who's saying 9,200, and we're gonna get to his price in a second. And you have Coslo, his inside the distance prop is probably a minus 900 or something like that, right? Um, Coslo, you have, I mean, it's it's a lot, okay. Um, Coslo wins by submission round three. I can't, I can't even find it. Um, Coslo wins the distance. Let's just say he's really, really long. I mean, look, he's a plus four to one underdog. So he's going to be really, really long as well. Um, so you look at the prices here and it's the first fight of the night. You have 9,300 versus 6,900. Now remember what you need for a 9,300 fighter to be optimal or to place someone you really want to target is you need to have I mean, probably both, but but you're looking for an inside the distance prop of better than even money, and per, per, prop, hopefully and some wrestling upside, which also involves some ground and pound, okay? Um, it's not enough to even get a couple of takedowns in, in decisions or even in a third round finish um, if it's not going to be accompanied by, by, by ground and pound. Um, so if, if for him to get there at 9,300, you probably need a first round KO and there's even no guarantee that that gets you there. Okay. Now you have, all you have is, is, is some tape and some very few people with takes on these guys. So I'll just share what I've heard and what I've seen. So Kozlo, if you look at him on YouTube, you can see a couple of fights, a couple of fights. He does have a lot of submissions and he takes, and he goes for grappling and he's finished people in the first round. That's all he does, okay? Um, is that all he can do? Who knows? Can he carry that into second and third rounds? Who knows, 
Okay. When you look at Cameron Simon, I mean, what do you have? You have a guy that's basically a striker, right? Um, he hasn't really taken anybody down. And he, who knows? Really, it's like like two fights under that people have seen. It's very possible this guy can wrestle. We just don't know. Um, but at ninety three hundred, I mean, you got to be pretty damn sure about what's going on here. I mean, you see like a lot of variations where Coslo. Let's just say that we know, we think we know what we're talking about here, and that Simon's a striker who's probably just much better striking than Coslo. I mean, but what if Kozlo just just grapples him up for the first round? Remember, if 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 Simon doesn't get there in the first round, unless he's got wrestling somewhere, I mean, he's just busting. So it, it seems to be a pretty awful spot, okay, to, to bet a guy at 9,300 in DFS. But remember, this could be the other way. I mean, just because, you know, this line might not be right, it's possible that he should really be 700, minus 700. It's possible he actually has takedowns somewhere. So I, I will say that this fight has quite a bit of variance to it, which is sort of what we want. But then what we have to look at is kind of ownership. So I'm looking at Samen, who's looking to be about 35% owned. Um, now, again, this this could change or, you know, I could change my mind about their ownership. But it just feels as though this is not what you're supposed to do. Is to is to bet this guy at ninety at ninety three hundred at thirty five percent ownership when we really have no idea what's going. On. Um, I I really feel as though maybe a better play would be Coslo, you know, because listen, if we're wrong on one side and he's really let, let's just say that Cameron should be a seven minus seven hundred favorite, okay? If he's supposed to look like a seven hundred favorite, is he going to make the optimal? I would say. Most of the time, but not all of the time, right? Because remember, he could get a first round KO or piece him up across the way and whatever, and, and maybe only score 100 at 9,300, which may not be enough. However, if it's more like a pickup, then I would say if that it, if it is a pickup, then Coslo, you're just going to want almost 100% of the time, right? The 6,900, you get a win. I mean, that's probably going to be good enough at 6,900. But again, if he's, if you're right and he's got grappling upside and he has submissions and all that stuff and we're wrong about the odds and it's, we're wrong to the, to the, to the Coslo side when you really want this. So I, I feel as though on a card like this, we're going to be, we're going to be, we're going to be doing this type of analysis pretty much throughout. And you're going to have a lot of lineups that really stink, or at least they look like they stink, but I think this is the way you have to play variance on a card like this. So I would say that I would be more inclined to play Coslo ahead of his ownership than Seaman uh, ahead of his ownership, at least in this first fight. So now we go ahead and, and we look at um, Vinicius Salvador versus Daniel Da Silva. So again, we have Salvador coming from a lower promotion. He's minus 250, okay? And his price is... 8,900. So what do you need from someone who's 8,900? I mean, it's, you need probably an inside the distance prop of about, mm, pick them would be nice, but we'll give them a break. Probably like a plus 120. Okay. That's kind of what you need. Uh, in addition, well, listen, if you have wrestling upside, that's so much the better, but um, that's kind of what you need. Um, so we'll look at his inside the distance prop, Salvador, and his inside the distance is it's pretty good. It's it's really good. It's inside is minus 190. So we split the difference in the big. It's let's say minus 160. So he has a very, very strong inside the distance problem, presuming that this is all not a bunch of crap, right? Because again, Salvador, we just don't know. He's fought nobodies. Okay. Um, and yeah, in his last fight, he knocked the guy out in the second round, but it's not like he was particularly great he was like backing up against the the the, the ropes he was kind of rope doping and he caught the guy with a hook i mean i don't know how do you compare that with with this guy um now it's a little bit better than the same fight because at least his opponent the silva is somebody that everybody's seen like a bunch of times like we know at least what Silva's supposed to be and what Silva is supposed to be is a guy who really just goes after it in the first round and then completely gasses. Okay. So what's worth doing is looking at his inside the distance prop. So to Silva 
I think is a minus, is a plus 300. Let's take a look at this. Yeah, they got all kinds of stuff here. You have the Silva inside the distance is splitting the difference in the big probably plus 300, plus 320. And that's pretty reasonable for somebody of his price. Okay. He's only 7,300. So for 7,300, that's probably what you want. Um, I can make the case that is, it might be even a little better than that because, well, again, now, now I'm putting my take in. What I was going to say is if he's a plus 220, I mean, how often does he really win by decision? Um, I don't know, maybe more than I think. But, but I think the Silva in a win is very likely to get a KO. And a KO at 7,300, doesn't really matter whether it's first or second round. That's going to be good enough. Um, um, now, what about Salvador, though? You know, like we just, again, we have, he has the one knockout, and De Silva has been knocked out a bunch of times, but we're just not 100% sure. So I think we have to look at it is what if this line is halfway? You know what I mean? Like you don't have two guys you never heard of, but, but what, what would this look like if instead of De Silva being, plus 200 what if it was like uh what if he looked like a plus 400 you know what, what would salvador look like at a minus 400 would salvador make the optimal probably right 8900 getting a first round ko that's probably going to do the trick okay um uh, de silva however once again if de silva is pick him i mean he's almost a lock right because 50 percent of the time he's going to be in the optimal so so I feel as though that there is variance in this one, in this line, but not as much as, say, the same in Kozlo fight. But then what we do is we go to ownership, and, and at least the ownership I'm looking at right now has Salvador as the most owned fighter on the slate at 40%. So it's, it's, it's just something that you probably want to get less of than the field, okay? Um there's just, to me, too much variance in, in a line like this. And if the variance is on the, listen, if the variance is on the Salvador side, he's probably optimal 65% of the time, right? But, you know, it's, if, if the line is right on, he's probably optimal 30% of the time, maybe, you know, but, but if the line is the opposite side, you know, then, then, I don't know. I think that De Silva is probably the better GPP play considering ownership and anything or anything. Because I'm looking at De Silva here and I'm seeing an ownership of ooh, 18%. I guess that's fair. You know, it's not as if he's like 8% or something like that. So I think overall, I think this fight is probably fairly owned and fairly priced, I guess. So I guess I would just kind of say that if you get to these guys, fine. But I wouldn't take a huge stand on either of them. I hope that makes sense. Okay, uh, Eric Silva against TJ Brown. Uh, you have a pick em here. And the price, well, you actually have a little bit of line value actually on Silva, on, on Brown. Because it is a pick em. Um, Well, it's not exactly a pick em. Silva's a little bit of a favorite. So, okay tiny little bit of line value on brown but not not enough to not enough to uh to make a big deal of it and remember the reason why that is, is if they were 8100 each that would reflect the pick them because tj brown 7900 that implies he's like a plus 120 that's pretty actually pretty close to what he is now to get in the optimal or to be a, a somebody that's good at 8100 or 8200 you don't need all that much what, what you need is either in my opinion like maybe like a plus 200 or so inside the distance or wrestling upside in a decision. Okay. Um, yeah, both great, but that's the deal. And and I think, I think both of these guys fit the bill. Like TJ Brown is going to be going for the rest. Um, so his win condition is very conducive to, I wouldn't say a top score because he doesn't really have a lot of ground and pound in him, but at least it's, it's, it's to a good score. Um, in a decision because you look at the inside the distance props you have what do you have here you have you know brown inside the distance is not that bad i mean 
when you combine his plus 260, which is, again, we're kind of splitting the big difference here, maybe even plus 300. Plus 300 of itself is not good, but but when you combine that with the wrestling, I think, that, I think Brown is decent. Now, Silva is what you want. I mean, Silva's got, you know, he's minus, he's plus 200 or so inside the distance, um, which is kind of what you want at this price. I think he's got a little bit of, of upside as well as far as grappling goes. So I think this fight is pretty is pretty cool. I, I like this one a decent amount. And unless these guys are going to be highly owned, I think this is a pretty decent fight. Um, now you see Silva at about, I, I have him at 23% ownership right now, but this is going to change. Um, and TJ Brown about the same. So I have both these guys as, as owned but not excessively owned. And I think this is, this is a good fight to kind of just make sure. I don't want to say make sure you have, but if you do optimals and you get a lot of this fight, I'd be okay with it. And when you actually build, and maybe we'll build one, I think this is a good fight to kind of put in your single entries as well. All right, uh, Billy Q versus Alexander Hernandez. All right, so this is these are two guys that everybody, you know, we, we, we've known. It's not quite that much variance in the line here. I think it's somewhat efficient, you know, except for the fact that it's obviously high big on both sides, right? But I think it's pretty decently efficient. So uh, let's just make sure there's no line value here. Uh, 8,600 versus 7,600 is pretty much what these guys are supposed to be um, given their price I mean, given their odds. Let's take a look at the inside the distance prop. So Billy Quarantino, uh, his inside the distance is um, plus 200, which is not the best for 8,600. However, what he has, Quarantino, is number one, he's got a lot of volume, which, which kind of adds up a little bit. You know, with significant strikes and he also does have some takedowns um and when you combine someone that has a lot of cardio with with a lot of volume and some takedowns that can generate a really high score and he himself has actually put up extremely good scores in his wins i mean i'll throw this up here um forget his losses because we don't care about those i mean he had 140 points two back with three takedowns well i didn't knock down two he had 109 points two fights before that. Um, and then he had 85 in a win before that and 131 in a win before that. Uh, that was in a second round sub. Um, so he is a he is a good DraftKings guy, you know? So even though his inside this problem is not the best, I think the volume and the wrestling kind of makes up for that. I mean, he's never going to just, and if he takes the guy down, he's never just a lay on him. He's going to continue to, to to cardio, you know, um, Alexander Hernandez. I mean, I don't really see it. I, I, I get, I see the inside the distance prop as being extremely poor here. I have uh, Hernandez inside the distance, I, I lost like 450 or something. And I've heard some takes that Hernandez is dangerous in the first round. I, I don't, I don't see, I listen, if that's the case. And everybody should just be betting him plus 400 inside the distance because. Because there's, there's, uh, you know, according to the to the to the line, I mean, you just, I don't want to play him at all. So, again, maybe we'll talk about him differently when we're talking about the betting odds. But um, as far as deep DraftKings goes, I, I don't see it. I don't see the Hernandez side here at all. So, for me, it'd be Billy Billy Quarantillo and probably none of Hernandez. All right, so Chris Curtis versus Joaquin Buckley. These are two guys. Again, we've seen a, just a ton of. So I think that the line here is probably going to be somewhat efficient. I think that anybody that really thinks that they could just get the best of these types of lines without gauging psychology, which, which we're going to talk about, you know, in the betting video, I think is asking for trouble, but you know, listen, everybody's trying to have fun, you know? So just because you might not be able to get a great edge doesn't mean that we shouldn't, shouldn't try to degen a little bit. I mean, that's definitely, and that's definitely, you know, definitely fun to do, but I would not enter a fight like this you know, I would not bet a fight like this presuming that you know that the minus 165 is just wrong in some way, you know, not not this. Um, so, well, first thing we look at is the inside the, um, excuse me, is the prices. Buckley 85 to 77, I guess that seems reasonable enough. Um, let's look at the inside the distance props. You have, Let's look at uh, Buckley first. Buckley inside the distance, plus 160 or so. 
um, or plus 170. Um, that's, you know, that's decent. Um, but when you think about it, Buckley plus 170, is that any inside the distance? Would you rather have that or Billy Quarantillo? What's his, what's, what was he, he inside the distance? Plus 200 plus the upside. No, maybe. Um, the difference is between Billy Quarantillo and Buckley is, um, is, is the volume. Like Buckley is not going to generate the same type of volume that Quarantillo is. So I, that's why I do favor Quarantillo. If you had to just go, you know, uh, play for play, I think Quarantillo would be like a little bit better. Um, but Buckley certainly does have some finishing uh, upside um, at that price. So I think, I think it's reasonable. I just think that Billy Quarantillo is a little bit better. And on the Chris Curtis side, you have Curtis inside the distance, uh, plus like 320 or so at that price. Um, I don't know. Is it, is it that bad? What is his price exactly on DraftKings? It's 7700 You know, as opposed to you get a plus 300 on the Silva at 7300 I will say this, that Curtis does have a, a volume-based decision in his – in his uh, quiver. Um, so he could get there in a decision if there's a lot of volume um, where the Silva does not have that. So I would say that Curtis is probably below the Silva in terms of good underdogs. But so far we haven't really come up with any great ones. So we're gonna we're gonna keep Curtis in in the mix here at least for now all right so let's uh move on uh we have shabazian versus uh versus uh, Lunyambula. and in cash i think this is one of the two easy ones so again these are two guys that people that have fought a bunch of times so i, th I think this line is pretty efficient so you have a minus 300 favorite like like I would presume that this Shabazian line at 300 is just a lot more, you know, a lot more solid than the Coslo minus 380 or the Salvador minus 250, you know, whatever. Now I'm not saying that necessarily that he's a good bet at minus 300, but I'm just saying that that's for another discussion for the betting video. But I think from a DFS perspective, I think you could have a little more faith that this line is efficient. So if you were going to play cash, you know, you get him at minus 300 at you know, what's this person, 9,400? Again, mean, what do you need for 9,400? Well, in GPPs, you need what? Um, probably a combination of of, of an inside the distance prop of, of under, you know, of, of even money or better. You'd like to have some wrestling too, but at the very least, you want to have uh, inside the distance prop of, of, of even money. So when we look at, I don't, do we, do we get that? I think it's close. Let me see. Shabazian by uh, Shabazian by well by KO is plus one ten like right there. Um, Shabazian inside this is minus one ten, so that's fine, right? It's not perfect because you want a little better than minus one ten, and and you probably prefer some wrestling upside as well. So what that is is a good example of a good cash play. You know, and, and I do think that that Shabazi and I wouldn't fade him completely in GPPs. It's more of a cash play than a, a great GPP play because again, you don't ex you have minus one ten inside this. It's good, not the greatest. You know, it doesn't exactly have. Let's just take a look at it. I don't think he's got. I mean, it doesn't really take people down. He's got maybe one. Well, he's got eight takedowns again in 2018 in this fight. I wonder what this is about. Maybe he does. Maybe he has sneaky upside. He did get a takedown against Imovov. I remember I was at this fight, and I just had the I'd be over in that fight. And I will tell you this: that after the first round, I knew that he was going to get get lit up, and he did. Um, but Imovov turned out to be really, really good. Uh, he had uh, he fought fought Hermans Hermanson. Really did kind of get beat up in that fight on the ground, so I don't feel much of a chance there. And then Brunson is is a tremendous wrestler, so he had no chance there. 
Um, in the Tavares fight, he knocked him down twice and out uh, in the first round. Didn't have a chance to get a takedown. And he did get a takedown on Marshman. So, you know what? Maybe Shabazian has some kind of sneaky wrestling upside that that we don't haven't really seen all that much of. Um, but I think in general, I think he's a good play. You know, I wouldn't go out of my way to fade Shabazian here. I think, it, I think the line is fair. You know, I, I think that he does have some upside. His inside of distance prop is okay. Um, it's actually good. And I think the, there is some wrestling upside that you could throw into the mix. So uh, I, th I think he's a very reasonable play. Uh, as for uh, Lou Jambula, um, I just, you know, uh, inside the distance, like plus 500 or so, plus 425. I mean, it's not the worst, I guess. Um, but I'd rather go for, I think I'd rather go for the, uh, for the, uh, for somebody like Kozlov, you know, or, or De Silva, guys like that, uh, then, then go to Lunjambula. Um, I'll tell you this, if I do run 150 and I get to some of them, I'm going to keep it. Um, but I'm not going out of my way to play it. So we're looking at the ownership though. I just want to take a look at this. So you have. Boy, oh boy, I've Shabazian is pretty low owned, I have to say, at only 23%. Um, I don't know. I might end up getting over on him. You know, he's it's a big favorite. And and he does uh, the inside of this prop is fine. It seems very secure. Um I don't know. I I kind of I kind of like him here. Okay, moving on to uh Raul Rosas Jr. versus Jay Perrin. Um so this one's really interesting. So this is, again, you have a guy, Raul Rosas, who is coming up from the Contender Series. And in his last fight, you know, first of all, he's, he's very, very young. He's 17 years old. Um, I think he's going to be 18 the night of the fight, which is going to allow him to fight. But And he he, he wrestled and grappled and, and won a three-round decision over some guy that was, that was nobody had heard of, right? And it's because of this, in large part, that – He's an enormous favorite. Um, and if we had any real reliance that this odd, that these odds were accurate, we could do a really, really good analysis and say, okay, let's take a look at the inside the distance props, look at the wrestling upside and things like that. But we have to, we have to, we have to account for the possibility that this line is a bunch of BS. Okay. That Rosas should either be minus 400 or, or, or zero. Okay, or pick them. Um, one side. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so what do we got? May as well just go and do the analysis. So Rosas, uh, inside the distance uh, is mm, minus, no, he's plus one. Why can't I read this? like plus 170 inside no no like maybe plus 150 or so they're all over the place with this one so plus 150 inside the distance which is which is not great okay he's plus 150 inside the distance which is not great for a price of 9000 okay however in his last fight he had a bunch of takedowns and was all over the guy with control time so is that enough to overcome the lack of a pick them inside the distance prop? Yes, I, I think it is. Okay. I think it is presuming the line is right. Um, is the line right? I don't know. I, th I think I literally would give it like 50% adjustments either way. So I think that this is a fight that you do want to kind of target. And, and I think you want to target both fighters, you know, um, but let's look at Perrin. So Perrin his inside the distance prop is extremely poor. It's plus 800. But Perrin actually has wrestling upside. This is what he does sometimes. So who's to say, really, that Perrin is not a better wrestler than the 17-year-old? Because the 17-year-old got five takedowns against a terrible opponent. Who's to say that Perrin would not be able to do the same thing? Um, so I feel as though Perrin, with his win condition, I think he's strongly in play here. Okay. I think that even if this line were accurate, 
you know, and and like the 50, like the median, the median outcomes where, you know, we presume the line is efficient. I think that if he, I knew that 33% of the time he was going to win, um, is that what this is implying here about that? If 33% of the time he was going to win and in those wins, it would be because of his takedowns. I mean, I'd want this anyway. So I think considering the fact that this line might be wrong to either side, I think that he's exceptionally should be played. As should, by the way, as should Rosas in this case, because again, I think Rosas is a pretty good play at, at, at an efficient line here because of the, all that wrestling takedown upside. And if the line is wrong on the other side and he should really be minus 400, then he has he has 120 points in it, okay? Um, However, let's take a look at the ownership. And you have Rosas. He's, you know, not the most uh, owned guy on the slate. He's, he's 28%. So I think that both sides of this fight should be played. Okay. Um, both Perrin and, uh, and Rosas. Okay, moving on. You have Dawkins versus Rosenstruck. So you have two heavyweights here. And, you know, we've seen these guys fight a billion times. I think I have to presume the line is somewhat efficient. So we have to just, there, there's one thing I'm going to throw into this, and I probably shouldn't have done this. But I want to throw in a take that I got from the interview. And only because, boy, oh boy, I probably shouldn't do this. It's going to affect the betting, betting video too. But I just have to throw it in here. But let's just, we'll, we'll get to it. Let's look at the, um, at the inside the distance props. You have Rosenstruck inside the distance. Well, first of all, let's look at the odds. Minus 170 plus 145, and the odds look pretty reasonable relative to the price. Inside the distance, Rosenstruck. Uh, Rosenstruck inside the distance is minus 115 or so, which is very, very strong for an $8,700 fighter. Um, that is, it, it's extremely strong. Okay. Um, and considering that the, um, you know, that we think the line is somewhat efficient, unless he's the highest owned guy on the slate. I mean, this is a, this is very, very difficult to fade. Okay. Um, not obviously difficult to fade, but it's difficult to deny. And when I'm looking at this, I'm seeing that Rosenstruck, I think you know, he's 32% owned. I'm the fifth highest owned guy on the slate. We'll take a look. We'll, We'll, we'll we'll continue to look at that as it goes, but um, uh, let's look at Dawkins's inside the distance prop because these are heavyweights. You know, you expect Dawkins to have something too. So Dawkins inside the distance is plus two thirty or so, which for his price is pretty reasonable, right? I mean, it's it's about the same as as what's his name, or a little worse than. Uh, Um, so I hope I didn't distract myself. So, yeah, so you have Dawkins, uh, Dawkins is inside the distance is, we were saying it's like plus like what, two, two thirty or so, which is fine for this price. Um, here's the one that I just have to share this. I mean, I don't know what to say, but they, they, they did the media day and, and they interviewed him and you can look this up if you want. And they were asking him about the fight and this, that, and the other thing. And, and he was saying, um, and he was saying, uh, well, how do you feel about this fight? And he says, listen, this guy's obviously a big hitter. I mean, if you think I'm going to stand in the middle of the trade and bang with this guy, you got to be out of your minds. And I'm not an idiot. So you take that for what it is. But if, if you believe him, then you, you probably don't want to play either guy. <laughs> if you want to know the truth. Um, yeah, Rosenstruck, who's is kind of a low volume guy, he just kind of waits and just gets that shot and just knocks people out. And if you have that against a guy who just said that he's not going to stand and bang with a guy, you're probably supposed to fade the fight if you want to know the truth. Um, so again, this is this is going against my thesis, right? About you're supposed to believe these lines. Um, so if you believe these lines, you know what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to play both these guys. But it's not as if this fight is is guaranteed. Okay, I, I will say that, um, and well, we'll talk about that in the betting video. But um, I I would just be careful about playing too much of either of these guys because of what I just said.
Um, so I think maybe be with the field on each of them. I guess that's the best I can describe it. Um, we'll take a look at the ownership real quick. You have Rosenstruck, who is, where is he? 32%. Feels like a fade. I don't know. Uh, given what I just said. The one thing about the Dawka side at only 18%, maybe, maybe he can get some wrestling, maybe. Maybe he can win like that. Oi, ay, ay, ay. Um, maybe. It's a really tricky fight. Uh, I'll have to give it another look. But listen, according to the numbers, you want to get both sides. All right. Ponzinibbio versus Alex Morono just added a couple of days ago, but fortunately it's a real easy one to deal with. Um from a line efficiency perspective, I think it's the only thing that's preventing it from being somewhat efficient is that the line came out late. So all the money hasn't come in yet. But aside from that, you have this, um, where's the, uh, the prices actually, um, prices look somewhat reasonable. Uh, and we'll take a look at the inside of distance props. As you'll see, neither guy looks really good. You have Ponzinibbio inside the distance plus two twenty. Wait, this is better than I thought. Nah, I mean, he's, he's plus 220, and he's the same price as Billy Quarantillo, who's got all the wrestling upside. Well, what about the Buckley side? How do you compare Buckley to Ponzinibbio? They're the same price, right? Ponzinibbio, 8,700. Buckley, 85. So Buckley's a little cheaper. And what did I say Ponzinibbio was inside the distance? Plus 230, where Buckley was what? Buckley was... Um, uh, he's more like plus 160. Okay. Yeah, Buckley's definitely a better player. Um, and yeah, I, I don't think I'm going to play Ponzinibbio. And as for Morono, his uh, doesn't have any wrestling. He's a very good striker, but uh, he doesn't really have an inside the distance prop worth discussing. He is actually plus like 700, so going to fade that whole fight. Okay, uh, Darren Till versus Drikus Duplicis. Um, again, there, there's enough on these two guys. Uh, Duplicis might not have the same amount of fights in the UFC. Tills were kind of a while ago. So I think that, I think it's fair enough to say this line is somewhat reasonable. And when you look at the prices, you have, let's take a look. You have 88.74. Um, I guess that's close enough. Maybe there's a little bit of line value in Till, but not much. Um, let's take a look at the inside the distance lines here. You have Duplesis, who is... Uh, the place inside the distance is, boy, this is better than I thought it was. This is plus 120, plus 130. Boy, oh boy, I didn't, I didn't even realize this. He, inside the distance, is plus about 130. That is just much better, for example, than the aforementioned. Well, first of all, it's definitely better than Quarantillo, right? Quarantillo was, well, he was plus 180, but he had the wrestling upside. But Duplice has a little bit of that, I guess. Yeah, Duplice is, a, I think, a better play than I may have given him credit for uh, originally. Um, I guess it's okay. Uh, now, again, it's not he's not the same price. He's, he's $100 more, but it's only 100 bucks. I, I, I have to say that I have to put him in the same class with with. Billy Quarantillo, except for the fact that Quarantillo just has, I don't know, he just has that big ceiling, you know, more than Duplicis. Duplicis in his last fight was kind of on his hands and knees to win that fight uh, by decision. Um, he was never really threatening anything big, so I don't know. Uh, it looks fine. Uh, Darren Till, on the other hand, um, at his price, again, we need like to have the plus 300 or so to even to be in, in competition here. Let's see what he has. Two inside the distance, and nah, that's more like plus 400, so I'm not interested in that. So we are at kind of a loss for some underdogs. Actually, that's not true. We, we've, we've gone through a couple, and we'll review them at the end. So Duplices definitely in play. 
till not so much. Um, so we have a couple more fights left, but no, we have three more fights. Um, what order do you want to handle this? Where is, where's the good one? Oh, do we pass this? Okay. So let's deal with, let's do, well, we'll, we'll save the Bryce Mitchell fight for a second. Let's look at, um, Jared Gordon versus Patty Pimblett. But what happened to the, oh, cause the Mitchell fight was booked. Okay, so we'll get to we'll get to that in a second. So Patty Pimblett versus Jared Gordon. Um, so very, I think it's a very reasonable price. You know, what I mean, as far as efficiency goes, um, we've seen enough of Patty Pimblett. We've seen enough of Jared Gordon to at least uh, at least think that this line is somewhat reasonable. So you have Patty Pimblett is minus two fifty, and he's he's only ninety one hundred. Um, Actually, it's the same as these other guys, right? So, same it was ninety three. He's same it was like a minus four hundred though. Salvador eighty nine. So, I guess from a money line perspective, it's reasonable. Take a look at the inside the distance props though. We have Pimblet. Uh, again, what do you need at ninety one hundred? You got to have like an even money, you know, inside the distance prop, and you know, pre preferably some wrestling to go fall back on. But can't get too greedy. So, can we get, take a look at Pimblet here? Inside the distance, minus 110, perfectly reasonable. And he does have a little bit of, of, of control time, takedowns, and things like that. Um, I don't know. Should I say takedown upside? You know, maybe not. Um, I think Gordon would have more of the takedown upside. But I think Pimwood's totally reasonable play here, um, considering his inside the distance prop. The only thing is his ownership is going to be probably really high. So we just have to take a look at that. Like right now, I have Pimlet as being thirty-five percent owned, third most most owned fighter on the slate. If that would be the case. I would I would rather go down to even Shabazian and pay the extra two hundred or three hundred, um, and just just figure it out uh, for twelve percent less ownership. Same, pretty much same inside the distance prop. So, um, but Pimlet certainly a reasonable play. As far as Jared Gordon goes, he. Again, at this price, he needs to have an inside the distance prop of about plus 300, maybe plus 320 at the best, um, or grappling upside. Now, Gordon inside the distance is extremely poor. It's like plus 600. But Gordon is possible that he's got control time and takedown upside if, in fact, he wins in a decision. There's a couple of issues here, and I don't want to get into this too much because it kind of flies in the face of the money line thing, but – it's going to be really hard for him to win a decision. I mean, the UFC loves Patty Pimblett, and for good reason. I mean, he's the future. He's young. He's dynamic. And they, they quote, unquote, want him to win, whatever that means. I just, unless Gordon really, really beats him up, he's just not getting a decision. It's just not happening. Um, they'll cry fix or whatever. But he's, Pimblett's just going to get the decision. He just is. Unless he gets destroyed. Uh, how does he get destroyed? I guess Gordon could go for a bunch of takedowns, but I mean, Jordan's older. I, Gordon's older. I, I don't know, man. Uh, I'll probably end up having Gordon just because of Pimblet's ownership. Okay. If Pimblet is 35% owned and I could somehow get a, just get these takedowns and control time and somehow get a, get a couple of, anti-English, anti-British refs, maybe he ekes out a 75, 80 points. Um, it's possible. Um, I will say that his, his ownership is extremely low. Okay? Um, I would imagine. Let's take a look. Yeah, Gordon is is less than 15%, plus the, the, the leverage over Pimblet, um, I'm going to have to play a little of them. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not going to probably play them too much in single entry or anything like that, but um, just because of that leverage, I don't the ceiling just doesn't seem to be there for this guy. But um, I think in a win, it's going to be because 
he could get the control and the takedowns. So I don't think there's a risk of him winning a decision of like 50 points, you know? So I think it's reasonable. And then in the main event, you have uh, Ankalaya versus uh, Jan Brakovich, which is, again, you know, they've been seeing these guys a lot. Uh, I'm sure the line is somewhat efficient. And uh, Ankalaya at minus 300. Uh, first of all, 9,200. What do you need? You need an inside the distance prop of about Pickham and or wrestling would be nice, too. And, you know, fortunately, he's kind of got both. Right. Um I think that he is the other real safe cash play alongside of Shabazian. Um, with respect to GPPs, um, well, let's take a look at it. So Ankaliyev, I think, is inside the distant prop is exactly a pick-up, right? Um, let's see. Uh, Ankaliyev inside the distance is about pick -em. He's actually a little bit worse than pick -em. So it's kind of an okay play not a tremendous play. What makes it kind of a poor play, I think, is the ownership. I mean, I have him 40% owned as alongside of Salvador being the most owned fighter on the slate. And I just think you need a little bit better, you know, than a plus 110 inside the distance prop and a little bit and, and, and wrestling upside. Um, It's an okay play, but again, a GPP's net ownership is rough. You know, I I would um I wouldn't x him out, but I'd make sure that if I played him, I would make sure that the rest of my lineup is really low owned. But as far as cash goes, he, he seems pretty safe. As far as Brokovich, I mean, this is I, I can't play him. I mean, his at this price again, you have to have an inside the distance prop of about plus three hundred or plus wrestling upside. And I'm looking at I have. Brockovich inside the distance, like plus like 480 or something. I mean, it's just no good, you know? So I guess that's one thing that's going to be good is he's probably going to be 25% on maybe just being the main event underdog. So if I X him out, I guess that's, that's doing something for me. So yeah, I guess that that's, that's something from this fight. I, I, I'll probably have some Ankalaya, but only in, in lower own components. Um, and Blahovich, I'm probably going to ask. So again, to summarize, you know, remember those, those first two fights are really interesting because nobody really has a clue. Okay. And they're the first fights of the night. So it's like your, your slate's going to be pretty well determined pretty quickly because you have two big time inside the distance props there. And the De Silva fight is, is, is right. I mean, both these fights can really do some damage to lineups. Um, ooh, I can't believe I forgot. Bryce Mitchell versus Taporia. I forgot about this because it's not on the best fight odds page here. And I can't believe I should be ashamed of myself because it's probably the best fight on the card. Let's take a look at this. Um, you have – and I'm, there's no way there's anything wrong with this line. Okay, just they've been analyzing this one to death. Um, so you have minus 130. So it looks as though Taporia should be about actually minus 140 is probably should be about 8,500, something like that. What's the price? 8,400. Fair enough. Um, so let's look at the inside the distance prop. So you have Taporia, who is, and again, 8,400, you don't need much. You need like a plus, like I said, plus 200, plus 250, maybe. Plus maybe some wrestling upside. Let's take a look. You have Tapuria, who is um, inside the distance, plus one set. Depends where you look. I, I guess split the difference, plus two hundred. Seems reasonable. And he's got he's got some 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 wrestling upside, sort of. But but the real wrestling upside is in Bryce Mitchell. Like Bryce Mitchell, I mean, his entire win condition is being able to take this dude down. Okay. Um, and you look at his inside the distance prop, it's like plus 400, whatever his entire path to victory is multiple takedowns here. Um, and in his last fight, I mean, you saw the type of ceiling that he's able to put up, you know, um, 
against Barbosa, he put up what's 140 um, DraftKings points, actually 125. But that's what you get when you have four takedowns and one knockdown, you know, plus 182 strikes in 11 minutes of control time. It's so hard to believe that that could actually happen in this fight, though, because of, you know, just because Tapuria is awesome, you know, and, and this is a, these are two really, really good fighters. And it's just so hard to believe that, that he's going to get all these takedowns. Like, unless Mitchell finishes him, remember, you need, you know, multiple takedowns to get the score that you need here, you know, and, and plus the control time and, and, it's a lot of disrespect to just say, just play Mitchell. Boy, oh boy. Um, but it's just kind of hard to, to ignore, you know. But here's something interesting. All right, let's take a look at this. Moffitt, he had one, zero takedowns, and had one reversal. Sales was was was, was whatever. Rosie had three takedowns, seven, four. Listen, you have to play some of him. Um I was expecting Mitchell to be extremely popular. As it turns out, he's not. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing Mitchell at only. Can't believe this is the case. I mean, Bryce Mitchell at where is this? I'm just looking at one model here, but eight, 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 fourteen percent. I mean, I'm going to have to try that. I mean, because listen, if he does get those takedowns, he's going to score a lot, you know. So I'm going to play him, but. Um, I think Tapuria's inside the distance prop is somewhat reasonable. So again, I think that this this fight is is okay. You know, I I thought it was going to be the fight I was really going to want to target, but it's just kind of okay. Um, one thing that's good is that I think these lines are all pretty efficient. So I think that that, that you can play this fight with confidence. If that makes any sense, if whichever side you take, um, um, it's definitely going to be a great fight, and we'll talk about this more in the betting lines. So, again, just to kind of summarize, um, watch those first two fights. You're probably going to want to have some of them or a good amount of them just because of all the variance associated with them. Um, I think that you really should have all four combinations of these fighters. I think you should really have a a, 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 a Simon Salvador, a Simon De Silva, a, you know what I mean, a Coslo De Silva, a Coslo Salvador in your lineups just because of all the variance associated with them. But I think of these four, I think Salvador is probably the worst just because of the of, of the ownership. Um, and then we have um, the silver brown fight, which is, you know, a very reasonable mid-range fight. And then as far as these underdogs that we talked about, um, I think that, again, those first two fights, the Silva and Coslo or two of them, the Silva specifically. And then Curtis is reasonable. I think Dawkins is reasonable. I think Perrin is good. Is 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 reasonable enough? I think Mitchell is reasonable enough. I don't like Till. I don't like Morono. I think Gordon is reasonable enough. Um, and I don't like the main event. Uh, the main event on the dog. That should do it. We're gonna go and we're gonna do an, uh, a betting video, which is gonna be a, obviously gonna be a lot different, and it'll be a lot of fun. But uh, good luck, everybody.